Dimitra, who is the founder of JBM, who are an executive search and recruitment firm who specialize in recruiting for high growth businesses and is also the host of his own podcast called The 40 Minute Mentor. James, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Hisham. Much appreciated. Yeah, obviously, we, we had this uh, in the diary to do it face to face in uh, your office, which is obviously down the road from me in, in London Bridge. But here we are today over Zoom, mate. How things yeah. change. Yeah, I know. The world is a, a very different place. But um, no, <laughs> still, still honored to be on the show and uh, delighted to do it, albeit virtually. Yeah, wicked. So I think what, what my intention is with the, the sort of podcast that I record during the, the times of what's going on is very much, we're definitely going to talk about your business journey, how you got into recruitment, um, and sort of what we always do here on the podcast, but we'll definitely have a segment on talking about how you're adapting today um, as a recruitment business owner. Um, but let's start where we always liked on this podcast, which is how did James enter the world of recruitment? Let's start there. And, and I don't think you'll be surprised. I, I, I've listened to a few of these episodes and um, uh, probably like a lot of people, I fell into it. Um, sure. I think back in the day when I was a kid, there were aspirations to be a professional rugby player, cricket player. I was always too small and not talented enough. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely thought I'd be a, a broadcast journalist, like the idea of being on Sky Sports News. Okay. Um, again, realised they didn't get paid that much and it was quite difficult and everyone else wanted to do it. Um, yeah. So, so for me, I never really knew exactly what I wanted. Um, I think I Did you go to uni? Yeah, I did. I did a history degree. Um, okay. Knew I didn't want to be a history teacher or a, a, a work in a museum. Uh, but <laughs> loved, loved the degree, loved the uni experience. Um, I actually, I worked for, I actually took a year off when I left school. Um, moved to London. Three blokes in a one bed flat in East London. It was, it was. One uh, bed? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Leave that to the imagination. There was, there was kind of <laughs> and it was Wait, was you near Shoreditch though? Yeah, no, not even that. It oh, really? Anna Park, and we had someone <laughs> in our garden one night. It was pretty, pretty rapey, but wow. um, the character building stuff. Um, but no, I um, I basically wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to leave home, live in London, save up, go traveling. And actually, that, that first year was, was actually my first exposure to recruitment because okay. I, I did, uh, I, I worked through, I think it was Randstad as a temp at Bank in New York. Um, wow. Amongst many other things, I, 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 I moon, well, I've moonlighted in the past as a singer. I did some gigs. I worked in. What? A, I worked at Buckingham Palace as a waiter. I did all sorts that year. Um, but I, I realised, you know, from the, from the experience of Bank of New York, and each summer when I was at university, I went back to the bank. I had no real interest in, in going to, into financial services. Um, and when I kind of left, when I graduated, um, I was kicking around at home. And basically, a mate of mine, uh, when I went to a rugby session, rugby training session pre-season, uh, worked was a manager at Michael Page, and um, he just sort of said, "Look, I think you'd be, I think you'd be a good recruiter." And you know, it's a, it's it's not the, it, it wasn't the greatest time post-recession to just the recession. What, was what year was this? It was 2009. Oh, okay. Um, but he sort of he sort of said, "Look, I think you should apply for the grad scheme." I thought I didn't know anything about recruitment. If I'm honest, I just yeah. I'd go along and, and you know use it as uh, interview practice. And um, yeah, and, and I really enjoyed the I really enjoyed the assessment centre. It was um, a bunch of similar like-minded people. And um, it was role playing. I did a drama A level, so for me it was just like acting. That. You know, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I did all right uh, on the on the kind of uh, mock role play bit. Um, and yeah, before I knew it, I was I was one of one of the first three people to be hired post recession into the grad intake but it was um it was a risky time they, they wouldn't they didn't want to hire you full time you, you had a month almost like a month rolling really initially yeah and then I, I started off in technology um and then quite quickly they realized I'd be better suited to the consultancy desk so strategy and change recruitment sure and that was kind of how how I ended up there and the rest really is it's kind of history <laughs> okay awesome really cool story so just to set the scene then, so you worked at Michael Page, I think I saw on LinkedIn, is it what, two and a half years or yeah. three, yeah. two and a half years? Two and, a half, yeah. and then after that, I don't think it was straight after, was it? But it was a couple of months apart that you then started your own recruitment business, which is now you've been running for over seven years. Yeah. yeah. So, right, yeah. so coming, coming up to the, the decades mark of uh, yeah. working in recruitment. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So look, let, let's definitely just talk a bit about 
the sort of Michael Page experience. So I guess, how, how did you find that? How, how, cause obviously you must have been someone that showed good promise, put in the work very early on, on a month by month basis, if they were sort of trying to protect sort of their investment in offering you sort of a monthly rolling contract. Right. So I guess that must've been quite intense. The, yeah. To be honest with you, they, they, they made, they, they cut one of the grads within a month, I think. And really? then they had the other two of us perm. So it was, it was okay after that initial month or two, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was, a uh, it was unlike anything I'd experienced before. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I learned tons. I, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the training I got there. Yeah. You know, the exposure I had, um, I, I worked in a really small, but very talented team. Uh, mm. and I had a brilliant, but demanding boss, a guy called James Barrett, who's still there. Um, and, and it was kind of, it was single swim really. I think I, yeah. You know, it was just at the time when the recession was kind of, we we're at the back end of it, but it was still tough. Um, so you had to hustle. Um, but because I was recruiting a lot for management consulting firms, they were being roped in to fix a lot of the issues in banks. And so I was, there wasn't, because there was only three of us or four of us in the team, I quite quickly had to get in front of partners, get in front of senior clients. Just really? Um, and so I had exposure to kind of senior clients, so, yeah so was you straight away 360 then basically was it perm or contract pretty much it was, it was all perm yeah um, uh, pretty much 360 i mean the bd stuff came um but um but but i loved it i, I loved i was allowed my style has always been very consultative i love sure. talking to smart people about interesting stuff um and i kind of i think i really reveled particularly with the client facing stuff quite early on um and yeah my team was brilliant and, and really supported me um i think I realized I was, I was very good at building relationships. Sure. Um, I, um, I, I really enjoyed the kind of, I guess I liked the pressure. I think um, I was mm. used to that. I, I kind of, the competitive sportsman within was, was kind of enjoyed that target driven environment. Um, and I had a lot of luck, you know, and, and, and in that first year, but it went pretty well. Um, and I guess set me up quite nicely. Um, so yeah, it was, a good, I had a really good first year, second year, not so good, if I'm honest. Really? Yeah. I think there's obviously you know Christian, don't you, Christian James? That yeah, yeah I um, heard it was very yeah, the similar experience. Very well, was was you like the top of the leaderboard then, or what? What was going on in that team? I, near enough, yeah. I, I I had a very I had a good first year in 2010, so my first full year. What did you What did you build that year? 205k. Yeah, first year. So that's not bad. Yeah. So I, I've had another guy on in the past called um, Tom Enifer, who I think he did. Um, I'm doing justice here, but. I think he did like 250 or something in his first year and that and he's been in recruitment now for over five years and that's wow. that's been his best year today yeah. and that's yeah. fucking killing him <laughs> yeah. it's, it's horrible. Uh, you know you, you set the expectations really yeah well. that's obviously what have... christian shared is that you've you've set the expectation and as you said so then second year sometimes when things don't start going your way it, it can be even more tough right yeah and, I, and i'm not um i've never been one to proclaim i'm like the world's biggest builder for me it was yeah. It was a combination of facts. I worked really, really hard. I worked yeah. longer hours than a lot of my mates working in banking in that first year. And my boss was really supportive. And, and we had roles. You know, we had great clients that were hiring. And it was yeah. opportunity. So it's, it was very different a year before that when there was nothing. And you really had to hit the phones and, you know, um, you know just try and hunt work down. Um, so I, that was lucky. But the second year was tough because my boss changed. Uh, you know, I, I really liked my my new boss, but very different working styles. Um, I had to, t you know, as you get more experience, you take more responsibility on, I wasn't yeah. the official manager, but you know, working with, with, with other people, grads were coming into the team, getting involved with recruitment of, of staff. Um, I, I found I was being pulled in lots of different directions. Sure. Um, and but still had the expectations I'm assuming of like doing good numbers. Yeah, yeah totally. That's and always I, the challenge, isn't it? I, and I can never remember exactly what I did, but it was, it was almost certainly, it was, it was half, I think half of, of the billings of the year before, yeah. maybe even less. And, and that, that really, I, I struggled with that. And I think, you know, I, listening to Christian's episode was really interesting because I think I probably did get a little bit complacent. Um, yeah. And, but if I'm honest, my head, head really wasn't in it. Uh, that that really? second year, I was tired. Um, I think in hindsight, I was probably quite stressed. And yeah. I, found the, I found my style wasn't always true you know, completely appreciated. I think that ultimately there is still that KPI culture. It is true. Sure. Um, and I think I, I got increasingly frustrated by that. Um, and I hate, you know, I was told consistently I couldn't do BD, 
which is ironic now because it's easily the best thing that, the thing that I'm best at. Um, yeah. But back then, that got in my head, and I, I hated the cold calling. I hated those sessions where you just got printing off yeah. a list of contacts just to get in touch with. It wasn't for me. Like I, I would try and get out of training sessions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All sickies, you know. I, I really, I really wasn't in the best place, and it's only in hindsight that I realised that. Um, but you know, and I had some fam- yeah, I had some family illness going on at the time, and I think I just head was a bit scrambled. Sure. It was only really when uh, my I got my my now wife, uh, my uh, at the time girlfriend, I got her uh, introduced her to Paige, and she did six months. Can't say she loved it, but um, <laughs> the, the the start of our relationship, and and it, she's known me since school, so we, we grew up together. And I think one of the turning points for me was when she just was just like, "You are not, you are not yourself." And what? It, but when she saw you in that business and stuff, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. I was that's powerful. I was, I was stressed and, uh, you know, always had the Sunday night blues and, and, and ultimately, and this is probably something we'll touch upon again, I really struggled to buy into that big corporate. Mission. Yeah. Um, really, really struggled with that. And, and I think ultimately that is where kind of, I think I drifted, checked out mentally. And it was really when I broke my leg playing rugby that I was forced, you know, to, to sort of step away from the day-to-day grind, had my leg in a cast and it was in, you know, at home for sort of four, four to six weeks it was then when I just went, do you know what? Like life is too short. Um, yeah. You need to change it. And I basically handed in my notice and, you know, took the plunge and, and, and wow. then started, uh, started looking for something else. But at that time I was basically like, I don't want to work in this industry. I'm done. Okay. Uh, which is ironic. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll, I am now. we'll definitely go into that. But what I just want to touch on is just um, two things there, which I, I'd like to think people will benefit from. So the first thing, just as you were talking about there, I feel like, there would be a lot of people that maybe resonate with that they may feel like um, they have the Sunday blues or they might have been mentally, they might have mentally checked out their recruitment job or whatever and, and find it really difficult or have been. But I think it's interesting, isn't it? Cause like, I think there'll be so many stories out there that it takes the sort of dramatic event of you breaking your leg to be like, James, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I think sometimes those events don't happen for people. And it, unfortunately, it happens for people when they're three years down the line, they look back and they're like, wow, I actually regret not making that decision or whatever, right? So I guess, it, obviously, hindsight's a great thing. But how do you think or what sort of comes to mind for you if people are sort of in that mental space of, you know what, I'm, I don't think I'm enjoying this, blah, blah, blah. What would your advice be to those people to try and move that event or encourage people to look in the mirror and try and cultivate them to make that decision themselves? Like what comes up for you with that? Well, so firstly, I, I think things like your show, to be honest with you, is, is a really useful tool for individuals mm. because nothing like this existed you know, when I was there, that, you know, it, and I think what people are now, they have access to stories from people that have been there and done it. And, sure. and, and I think one of the first things I would say is that you really need to look inside and work out if you actually want to do this job because yeah. it isn't for everyone. I think a lot of people just get their head down. Maybe it's the money trap. Maybe it's the, I, I don't know, maybe it's stability, but unfortunately there's, there's a lot of people in this industry that just keep plugging away that I just don't think it's the right thing for them. <laughs> yeah. um, but I also think there's also a lot of great recruiters that get very disillusioned because they're in the wrong company mm. and they don't buy into the mission and they don't, you know, they're not. And I think that is absolutely critical for me. For instance, I would struggle to recruit probably anything else. I love the area of the, I love working with startups and scale ups. I love working in strategy and operations. I would really struggle to get motivated to recruit other, other sectors. Sure. And that's just me. Um, and, and I have to buy into the mission of a business. So, so one thing I would say is sometimes it needs external influence to yeah. help you see that. And that's why I would, and not to plug my 40 minute mentor podcast, but mentorship is so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, get a mentor, get someone that's maybe outside the industry or even someone from within it that can actually give you objective advice and, and ultimately call you out and tell it to you straight because there's no mm. point having a mentor unless they're going to be super honest with you. Sometimes you just need to have that candid chat with someone about how you're feeling. And I think there's tons now that I think it's becoming the, we all have mental health and I think um, it's becoming less of a, hopefully the, the stigma is being broken down a little bit. Sure talking to people, being honest about how you're feeling and actually sort of forcing yourself to look within. If you're not yourself and if you're struggling and if you have those Sunday night blues, the great thing about the environment today is there are so many things you can do to change it. You know, yeah. you can reach out to businesses that you're inspired by. You can, you can listen to podcasts like yours and, and hear of different ways to do the job. Um, 
And ultimately, when you've been in recruitment for a while and you have those skills, they are very transferable. You know, yeah, yeah, totally. Transferable. You know, Couldn't agree I, more. Yeah, when I look at our client base, you know, one of the most popular, most sought-after skills is, is sales and account yeah. management. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not yeah, that's what comes up for me, to be fair. I think, yeah, I think, I'm, yeah, I love how you sort of spoke about that. I guess, yeah, the first thing is, yeah, be, be honest with yourself um, uh, in terms of are you enjoying it? What parts do you enjoy that you don't enjoy? Is it the market or whatever? And then also, yeah, as you said, don't, definitely don't um, underestimate how valuable your skill set is that you learn in recruitment. I've definitely experienced that firsthand, the sort of journey that I've been on. And then also, yeah, I think that that's the great thing about sort of the environment that we're in now is that don't sort of be under the illusion that recruitment is how it is in your business everywhere and how it's done or whatever. So, okay, cool. And then the other thing that I wanted to uh, ask you, because obviously you clearly spoke, and this is quite common in, in big businesses, people get access to great people quite quickly. But looking back, why, why was that manager, um, why did that manager have such an impact on you, do you think? Um, he was tough. He was really, yeah. he had, he had very, very high expectation. Sure. Um, and he would, and, and I'm not this sort of manager. So, so I, I um, it, it's interesting, isn't it? That the, the type of managers you respond to, but it doesn't always mean that's going to be your <laughs> yeah. um, At times, maybe I think I should have been more like him, but um, he, so he effectively, he had really high standards. Yeah. You know, he would put me on the spot with things. What does that mean? Like, and it, it was, it was a style that didn't work for a lot of people. Yeah he's been super successful and he he ultimately had my back as well like he supported me you know when I, there was some i had some sort of family illness going on he was incredible i remember him taking me out for dinner once and i was really struggling with a family member being unwell and he took me out for dinner he just listened and talked and supported me so awesome. I, I always he had my back and i had his and he was also very very good at the job so i learned times going to client meetings with him he's the first person i worked with it you know, and actually a couple of others in my team who the client genuinely listened to what they said. They, they mm. were experts in what they did. And I took tons from that. And I actually lo- I liked the way he challenged me because it forced me to raise my game. Yeah, so that, nice. that was kind of the, the, the main, the main yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Cool. So you broke your leg playing rugby. Yeah. Rugby careers out, out the yeah, window. Yeah, yeah, um, so obviously, yeah, a couple of months, I'm assuming reflecting, which I'm sure a lot of people now are in that position. Obviously... Haven't broken their leg, but on furlough, <laughs> and and it's yeah, genuine. I think it's going to be interesting. I think obviously with what's going on now, I think a lot of people are. I personally, if you, what am I trying to say? Like, if you're not really clear on why you're doing what you're doing, what your purpose is, I think a lot of people are going to have the, a lot of time to think about that and sort of where their careers go and these types of things. Not but I'm sure an opportunity, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think obviously. Um, obviously when when you experience that i'm sure that you was in in your house flat or whatever um legging the cast you're like okay well, what the hell am i going to do right so obviously that led you to handing your notice so did you did you and at that point you said that you was considering not working or remaining in the industry so what talk to me about the thought process of you leading up to starting your own recruitment business well i was i was i was lucky in some ways because i knew at that time given the, the dynamic of our team that that michael they, they needed me as much as I needed them in some ways. So I was able to have, and they were very, very good with me. I, I said to them, look, I, I'm not going to do this long term. Yeah. I don't want to go to another recruitment firm. I want to hand in my notice. And, but I will stay until I found something until we found a replacement for me. So it was, a, it was good in that respect. And they gave me the time to go into you. And, and it's not always said about oh, nice. firms, but that was, that was really helpful. And I think, you know, hopefully I went about it in the right way. Um, and I tried different things. I, I interviewed for a, a sport uh, to be a rugby agent. I, uh, <laughs> I interviewed for a sales role in a professional services firm. Um, and I ended up basically going to, to work for a former client that had set up a management consultancy. So I'd been recruiting for consultancies. Yeah. And this was a startup uh, business. And, and they'd heard, it was actually uh, her and her husband had heard that I was looking for a change and they wanted someone young and entrepreneurial, relatively cheap, um, who, who wanted to help when it comes to business development. And so basically I joined to help leverage my network, to help them sell consulting solutions. And it was completely the opposite. It was yeah. kind of, I was given a credit card, an iPad, which at the time was like incredible. <laughs> Uh, one of those ones that now is probably the size of my laptop. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, and then it was like, go win us some business. Um, 
and it was I was completely out of my depth. Really? Um, and uh, yeah, I, and frankly, realised very very quickly that selling people and selling in people to, to roles is completely different to selling consulting solutions. I can imagine. And and it, you know, I, I learned tons, but I I didn't set the world alight. And it was really only kind of I enjoyed the staffing of the project piece. I enjoyed learning from great entrepreneurs because they were. But I found it lonely and I found it, um, I just found it difficult. And I think it was only about nine months in where it was the summer, there wasn't much to do. A few of my old clients had been consistently reaching out to me saying, I don't suppose you can help with that X, Y, Z. And I said, well, to the, to the partners, I said, look, do you want me to just set up a recruitment business on the side of you? Just to, you know, I think there's some money that could be made here. I wanted to prove myself because I hadn't nailed yeah. with the other yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I, and I kind of, yeah, picked a couple of clients, generated about 30K for them that in, in a month and was like, that was kind of the light bulb moment. It's like, yeah. hey, well, if, if I can do this and all of these ca- clients of mine, all these candidates of mine, it's doing it in my own style and I don't hate it, perhaps maybe I just need to go and take the plunge and, and, and do it on my own. And they were very understanding. And that's, but that's basically the genesis of JBM. It kind of, I was 25 um, I, I, the thing I loved from that experience was the entrepreneurialism. Yeah. I just sort of thought like, and I'm sure lots of people listening will have had this, like I, I was, and I feel embarrassed to say this now, but I, I was ashamed at times about being a recruiter. Yeah. And I remember going to parties and, you know, dinners and stuff and, and people ask me what I did and you're rolling their eyes and going, oh yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. this type person. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but I, I, I remember at times just thinking, well, and it was that kind of moment where I was like, well, do you know what? Unless I do something about that, you know, I'm not like everyone else. I never have been. I've always been my own person. I've got my own style, my own way of doing things. And I thought, well, actually, if I, if I set up a business on my own, do it in my own style, in my own sort of with my own values, maybe I'll start to change some of those hearts and minds. Yeah. Um, but also I've got nothing to lose. I love a challenge. And um, when I started talking to people about it, there were lots of people saying, you know, it's not going to work. You're 25. You've only been doing recruitment for two years, you know, good luck. But I, I was going to say, how did, how did you overcome that? Because I think, yeah, I think a lot of people would have that um, imposter syndrome and, and let that, let that voice. I, I certainly had that uh, conversation myself when I sort of started my business 10 months ago. Um, yeah, just turned 27. So similar sort of ages. Yeah. And, I very I always tell people I definitely had the conversation of Hisham, who are you to start a business like this or help people with this? You have you've only been doing it for how many years, or whatever. So yeah, I, I totally resonate with that. But I feel like a lot of people will feel like that. So how did you um, block out that noise? Uh, I've always liked to challenge. Um, yeah. For me, and I think this this probably says a lot about one's entrepreneurial ability or whether it's right for you, because for me, that, that was the far in the bed. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to prove people wrong, uh, you know, and that it didn't, it didn't, I didn't, whereas there is definitely lots of times I've had imposter syndrome over the last few years, but sure. actually, interestingly, at that point, I was like, nah, I'm going to go for this. And, you know, th- there are some other really important factors here. Like I, I didn't have tons to lose. It's not like I had a mortgage. Um, yeah. My girlfriend, Lucinda, who's, who's now my wife, was incredibly supportive. Like, she's always has been. And she awesome. She believed in me. And she was like, you can do, like, go for it. Um, and, and probably the other really important thing is I, I did run this concept past clients and candidates. And yeah, they were, yeah. And they basically said, look, your style is what this industry needs. Like, we will back you. We will, we will work with you. And, and that kind of gave so that me... that instilled confidence. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah no, so I was just going to say, so... How did you how did you plan to be different then? Because I think this is I think obviously what you're talking a bit about there is sort of changing the sort of perception of recruitment in your in your market and these types of things. Like what what was the strategy behind JBM to be different? Because I think that's all where that a lot of this recruitment businesses start with that intention, don't they? That I want to do it yeah. my way. And this is what you're talking about. So what was your thought process to the sort of business strategy and how how did you plan to be different when you started it? Yeah, I mean Every, every recruitment company says the same, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but for me, I guess I wanted to prove it. So uh, when, I, when I was, I remember like, writing down some words about what I want to be known for at the time, the values or the, the characteristics were I wanted to be seen as like an honest, consultative, very relationship-driven 
recruiter. Yeah. But I was like, well, how do I prove that? And ultimately it's just through delivering great service. Like mm. and, and the proof's in the pudding. So for me, it was just about in those early days, it was about hustling, getting opportunity, delivering, like going above and beyond, and then letting the work do the talking. So JBM has grown exclusively through word of mouth in terms of business development. Every single client we've ever won. Okay. I may have gone, oh, I really want to work with that company and, and, I, and spoken to someone and they've put me in touch, but it's yeah. all come through somebody recommending us. And, awesome. and, and I set out like that was for me was always going to be the benchmark and like how we, you know, we grew. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, I think, yeah, it was about proving that early doors. And um, so I mm. kind of, um, I sort of set, that's kind of how I set out and just like, that's how, what I'm going to be known for. I, I obviously knew the sector. I, I wasn't trying to do something totally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've recruited obviously, into- Covenant, Covenant's obviously been finished by then. So uh, it was, yeah, mainly financial. You got more experience by actually working in the industry as well. So yeah. adds to the story. Exactly. And, and that was exactly it. I, I initially started by saying, I want to go work with startup consultancies because I just come from one. So that's how I started. And it was yeah. a good story because I was saying, look, I understand the pain points because I've been in one. I've recruited yeah. as a client. Um, and I want to, you know, I was ultimately saying to clients, I want to be a partner. I do not want to be a transactional recruiter. If you want me alongside five other agencies, that's fine, but that's not going to be really what I'm looking for. I want to help your business grow alongside my business. And I was saying, look, what I also really care about is getting it right for the long term. So for me, it was always about understanding the values of the business, understanding what makes it tick. And then ultimately, and getting to spending the time to, to get to know my clients better than most. Yeah, and then, awesome. And then delivering on that by finding the right culture fit, not always the right CV. And I think I've always been tried to be quite lateral in my thinking around fit. And I think sure. uh, there's not, not always been a science to it, but a feeling sometimes. And, um, and I, I guess I tended to get that right in the early days. And, and that really helped. How, how was your first year then? How did it go? Uh, first year was pretty good. Um, was it just you? Oh, yeah. yeah first two years so I was and was that always the plan like what, what did you even think about this being a yeah. lifestyle business or growing the business it's a really interesting question if i'm honest when i started i had no idea yeah i had no idea what i wanted do you think that's okay i i think so i yeah. mean it depends on who you, the sort of person you are because for me if i'm if i'm if i'm truly honest i i i wanted to i just want to start a business uh, mm. i wanted to see if it could work but i i purposely kept under the radar we had for two years we had no website no data really no nothing yeah it was no all, database all through word of mouth everything on excel not the best way to do it like, if oh I'm, no i should have set that up earlier <laughs> it, was, it, was all through, it was all through word of mouth and part of that and it's only on reflection i, I was also worried about it failing <laughs> so i didn't want really? my Michael page not to know that I'd set up on my own. So everything was done under the cloak of darkness. Wow. And, but it was, it was also, if I, if, if I think about it now, I wasn't sure where it was going to go. Yeah. But I also had some, some financial goals. So I am not money motivated. Um, I, I never really have been. Um, but what I decided was actually a really good way of kind of giving myself some targets was, um, was thinking about it. I, I wanted to marry my girlfriend. Um, we, we went to school together. So as soon as we, even though we were young, um, I knew it was, it was it was it once we got together because yeah. all our friends are the same, our families know each other. You know, there was no going back. And I'm punching, so I needed to get. Around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, I, that was the first financial goal: afford a ring. Second one was pay for the wedding uh, with some support from from our families. And um, third one was have like a dream honeymoon that we'd never normally go for, but like you know, basically go for it. And then then finally, it was to get on the property ladder and basically over the, the course of those two years I, I ticked those off and awesome it was only at the end of that i was like oh shit I, i've got a business here there is actually a business and it was, yeah, really yeah. That, it was at that two year mark that is when i actually would say i started to properly build jdm but yeah so that so that's kind of how it all began and like that first first few months were a hustle and challenging and i almost ran out of money at month four I had to borrow some money. What would you spend the money on if you didn't have a database, didn't have a website? Well, this is, it. This is what I say. You don't need much to set up a business. Yeah. You probably need a bit more now than, than you did. But Because um, I, I literally phone. Uh, I yeah. set, I, a mate did a really, really, uh, no offense to my mate, but a pretty crap logo. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then I, I, it was just copies. I was going coffee shop to coffee shop around the city. Really? Just, just, just trying my luck. And um, I think 
I, I, and to be honest with you, my mate, uh, my mate uh, Tim, who who comes back into this story, he became my business partner. He, he worked for me at Michael Page. He went to a startup, and he got me in to do some 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 recruitment for them in house for like a couple of months. And that nice. was recruiting chefs and waiters and all sorts. But it was just trying to keep the cash flow going. Um, but I, I, you know, it ended up it ended up going really well. And that first year, the the kind of changing point for me was when I realized if, if I kept working with startups, I was going to run out of money. And I almost did at that kind of four month mark. Um, why, why is that? Because it was just, too, the fees were relatively low. Uh, like my first, my first fee was 5K. I think I made the first three placements came to about 15 grand. Yeah. It was, was, was great. Like, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're starting off on your own, but it was just like, that's not going to keep you going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lean period. Um, and basically, I... I how quickly did it take to make your first placement then? About three months. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah, about two or two and a half, about two and a half months. Yeah, um, yeah. And and but then it was kind of three in quick, relatively quick succession. But the the, the game changer was when I went I went down to meet a candidate, ex candidate at, at one of the big banks, and he we were just talking about how he was going, and he was he was using a top exec search firm for his COO, uh, yeah, COO role for his business, and we were chatting about it and i just said oh it sounds like you need an ex-management consultant and um, and he was like oh okay yeah i was like you know they can face off to the regulator they can drive change they can shape strategy and he was like oh do you, do you know some of them and i was like yeah um, <laughs> and then and basically i just blagged my way onto this coo search for this big bank never done coo recruitment before but it kind of felt like a good extension and i'd gone from just having to these small little clients yeah. all of a sudden a tier one bank and that that was a 35 gram fee that I, when i filled it and that was kind of like game changer breathing room i could then say i'd work with this bank and that was that was when i started that year to then you know start reaching out to my old contacts at bcg deloitte ey santander etc and, and that kind of that's when it started to take a, a bit of momentum so yeah uh, long-winded way of coming back to your original question yeah yeah, yeah. It was about, I think we did about 186k in year one. Yeah, uh, so that's not bad, is it? Just you, no yeah, website, no me. database. And I didn't even know if it was. Yeah, and I'm not your. You know, I've heard some stories from some some of the guys, mm. and I'm not like a lot of other. I wasn't like love. It wasn't like oh my god, I want to set the world alight. I was just, you know, it was those small financial. Well, not small, but those for me, I had those yeah, yeah, yeah. targets. And then I was just enjoying running my own thing. Uh, but I had mm. no life. I didn't see any of my mates for a year and really it was long, long days and, you know, pretty, pretty hard work at times, but, um, but it was good fun. So, so just a quick one on that to wrap up sort of year one, then knowing what you know now, what, what would your advice be to people that, yeah, have, have really been thinking about starting their own recruitment business? I think it's the first year that people are most worried about how it's actually going to go. If they're going to end up, like you said, recruiting chefs when they really, they want to do something else or whatever. So like, yeah, what, what would you how what would you say to those people? I mean, if if you're good at the job, like if you have the recruitment skills, and most importantly, if you have, if you're great at building relationships, and you look at things from a longer term perspective, then I would say like, as long as you've got that risk appetite, I would always go for it. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I, I think when you when you make that step change and you you really commit to it, you just have to accept that it's going to be hard work. It's yeah. going to be there's going to be awful days. And when it's your, when it's your baby, those highs are amazing. And those lows are like killer. And yeah. you all know this, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, you take things very personally, particularly in those. Oh areas. yeah. hundred percent. Um, so I think for me, it's about one, you know, you, you need to be known for something. You, you've got to have, a, you've got to have be a specialist in something these days. I think you've got yeah. to, so you've niche got to is important. Of, niche is important. I think you've got to be able to, you know, you've got to have relationships. To be, I, I'm not, um, I'm not one of those people that could just set up something from cold, like, and mm. fair play to those that do. But for me, you, I think you've got to have relationships that trust you and will go with you. Um, or, or if not, at least know the space well enough to, to know who to go after. Yeah. And then for me, it's, if I'm honest, it's about working hard, hustling, being creative and adding value. And, and, and in this day and age, building your personal brand mm. uh, and your company's brand pretty quickly. So it's clear why, amongst all the noise and all the other competitors out there why people should work with you um and i still think there is a huge opportunity for values driven honest you know down to earth people that have something about them in this industry i think there is a huge opportunity still yeah why did it take the two-year mark for you to think that you've got a real business then because i think a lot of people would go well hang on a minute 
like hundred I'm just under two hundred grand in your first year. Like why was why yeah, why did it take that extra year for you to go, you know what, I'm happy with what I'm doing here? Like I think because I didn't know what I was building initially. Yeah. Um, but but it, the breaking point was I, I wanted to go on honeymoon. <laughs> so I kind of, um, I got to this point, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be closing deals. My wife's going to divorce me before, before I get back because I'm going to have to work through this. Um, and I was getting a bit lonely, if I'm honest. It was, yeah. uh, it was tough. Um, and, you know, we... Do you thought, not have anyone to speak to? I did, but... Because was it just I, like mates or...? Because I set up JBM relatively early uh, in my life, I knew a lot of people that had done... You know, I went down to meet James Kahn's lot and all that. And yeah. I, there were people like that who were incredible entrepreneurs, made their millions. And there were people that I knew that had failed. Yeah. <laughs> there were very few people within five years of me that I knew. I'm sure they were out there. But yeah, yeah. There weren't many people that I could actually go, how do I do this? Well, and this is why I absolutely love mentoring and yeah. encouraging others to, uh, to set up on their own um, because I felt like I missed that a lot. So I did have, I had great mentors. My uncle was a huge sounding board for me during that time. Awesome. Um, my, my old bosses at Michael Page were, were, were great. But, um, but yeah, the, for me, the, the big thing was I just, I, I wanted people around me. I'm a people person. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, I totally get that. And it, and it all, it was all very fortuitous because um, one of my really, one of my best mates, uh, Shawandi, he was in kind of a, he was, he was a lawyer um, and he, okay. he'd taken a career, but he'd kind of become disillusioned with, the legal industry a bit uh, it took some time he went snowboarding and he came back to stay with me afterwards and we were talking about you know he, he's a super smart guy um, had all the qualities to be an amazing recruiter and um, and he was like looking for just you know i love love working with clients and stakeholders you know I'm, yeah got this entrepreneurial itch and i was like dude i'm going on honeymoon in two weeks like how do you fancy following me around for the next next sort of fortnight and learning the ropes? And then would you be up for kind of taking the reins? And that's basically how JPM made their first hire. It was one of my really? best friends, lawyer, never worked in recruitment and hats off to Shawandi. He, he, he came in, it was, uh, as I said, no web, no, no website, no database, completely unstructured. Um, and, uh, and he had to kind of pick up the reins and he, he did an amazing job. I mean, he, he was with me for a year. He then went in house because he really needed some, like stability and like proper yeah. grounding. And he's gone on to have a super successful career in, in in-house legal recruitment. And um, uh, yeah, so that he was number one hire. And then when I came back from honeymoon, uh, Tim um, came on board. Who was ex Michael Page and very good friend. He worked. Really for, you worked with him as well. Yeah, and he was the that was the game changing moment because Tim was really good at a lot of things that I I'm not. Uh, you know infrastructure stuff project yeah. management people management like he loves all that and he was he came on board with shawandi and it was like right tim's gonna put in place our database uh, he's gonna help with hiring he's gonna yeah. you know, take a load of other stuff you know take on on the finances um and that was kind of it was that point and then for the next sort of few years where we went on a steady but growth growth trajectory and i think at the time we the intention was let's scale and exit let's try and sell this thing that was the intention and it was at the time um, so you weren't money motivated mate well it, it, <laughs> it, was, it was more the ride like more yeah, the, yeah 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 uh, you, you make a good point um but and this is this is actually really important because ultimately i don't think i ever wanted to do that but for really? whatever reason i went i went along with it because yeah and it wasn't anyone else's fault it was completely mine but um mm. I don't think that was ever what I wanted because that just doesn't really get, that's not really in my nature. And um, so, um, yeah. So the next okay. year were hiring, growing. So, so let's, let's just frame that out then. So yeah, year two, then obviously Tim joined just after year two or whatever. And then, so obviously then we're coming up to the, the next sort of five years. So, so if we were to break that down, the sort of first two and a bit years of Tim being involved, was that then when, yeah, ultimately you were getting the things in obviously infrastructure in place, looking at growing yeah. the business, but, but ju just quickly, how, how important would you say it is for people to um, really think about starting a recruitment business with other people? Like you've done it obviously on your own. I'm doing starting a business on my own. What yeah, I, I think, think? I think it's got to be on the individual. Um, yeah. Yeah. I personally, there's huge benefit for doing it on your own. You make yeah. mistakes, you're doing it on your own time and money. I, think yeah. I always feel a huge responsibility for others. And, um, you know, I've always said JBM's a family. So once you're in the family, like it's, you know, I take that very seriously. And in some ways, you need to make your mistakes on your own time, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that said, you can act, if your if your intentions are to scale um, and build a you know, then I think there's huge value from um, from partnering up. You, you look at the the three search guys, which I don't know well, but um, you know, Andy, I, I've, I've met a few times in their X page, and that, that what they've been able to achieve is so impressive. And I think probably you know, there's, there's right. Who's that? Sorry, did you say? Free search. Our free search, yeah. yeah. Part like, of like eleven investments. Yeah. I see no Joe over there. Um, I don't actually know Joe, uh, but um, they're they're kind of sort of contemporaries of mine. Yeah, sure, sure. But like you see, what three guys so can, can do? Them. Yeah, you, you can really uh, you know escalate and accelerate growth. Mm. So for me personally, I'm really glad I did it the way I did. Mm. But um, but I can so- totally see how having someone to bounce ideas off. And, and kind of take on things earlier can can accelerate growth. can accelerate yeah so how 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 did you how did you plan to to grow this business then like so, how, what what was the plan yeah i mean the, the plan was effectively to to kind of launch into new areas so we, we at the time we were doing financial services strategy and changes mainly consulting yeah. clients and banks um we ended up so within a year of that so year three we were five um we were hiring grads sort of someone with one year's recruitment um initially sort of through our networks and then we kind of we got a bigger office we got bullhorn we got q90 we kind of started to make some bigger investments yeah uh, you know and and i think you know we uh, the, the way we were going to grow was we launched an insurance business so went into a new area didn't really know hired a, a guy called jimmy who was who's, who's a great recruiter and had a really good networks in that space um, and, and that was kind of how we were going to go we were going to hire in kind of we were going to have sort of three directors and then hire in sort of grads and, and bring them up through the ranks yeah uh, and it was a real it was a real mixed bag you know we had we had some a mate the, the vast majority of people we've hired were brilliant like culturally great fits added a lot of value um but the truth is not all of them made the money and and and, and i think probably we we made we made a few mistakes um but we had in those kind of those great years we had you know quite a lot of success you know we we, we did our first international placement in 2016. We, um, you know, we set up a, a really, I think a really inspiring set of uh, board of advisors. Um, you know, we hired Alice, who's, who's still with JDM, who's a yeah. fantastic recruiter in 2017. And, you know, so we had lots of, there was lots of good. Um, and we had a, what I think was a, a unique and a really, really good culture. Um, and, and I guess Tim was doing a really good job of, of hiring and developing the team. Um, I was focusing more on, building out the exec search side and business development. But, but yeah, it, it kind of, our overheads went up considerably. Um, and, you know, we, we got to a point uh, sort of a couple of years ago when I think we were having to compromise, we were growing, we'd grown to about six, seven. Um, we were starting to compromise in terms of the types of clients we're working with, lots more bigger corporates, less control. Um, and frankly, we were still a bit too reliant on, on my billings um, and my networks and not everyone was it just wasn't quite working um, mm. and it was a really challenging period what, what were the mistakes during that then because I think th- this is this is if I'm on the me- the message that I get a lot from particular recruitment business owners is very much it's just, it's just the most ironic thing isn't it that the, the mistakes that you make and the most challenging part is is getting the people right for your own business when you're in the business of getting people for <laughs> other businesses do you know what i mean okay. so like what what are some of the sort of key mistakes you think that people can learn from that you can obviously have the benefit of of hindsight yeah i mean when it comes to hiring i think it still is the most difficult thing for recruiters to get right um for themselves uh, which is as you said completely ridiculous and ironic. Yeah. but again i think when it's your business um you feel so invested and i think the mistakes that we made and that i hope people can learn from you know, we, we, we hired on culture fit a lot. Um, and I think we hired some great people that weren't necessarily always right for our business or our sector. Mm. And, and that was really hard to take because in, in, more often than not, we really liked them. And we yeah, you really like them. Yeah. Um, I think I wouldn't change the fact that I the first few hires were friends because in those early days, um, having that trust, that dependable really helps, yeah. you know, really, really helped. And we had a lot of fun. Um, but there was also a time when that we needed to part ways and that, 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 that came about. Um, and I think there's something to be said for, um, having a rigorous interview process. You know, I think <laughs> there were times when we, we were growing and we were so busy and doing really, I guess to the outside world doing really, really well, like doubling our revenues and, you know, it, and that happened for a few years, but actually 
our costs were going up uh, yeah. considerably and and i don't think we always had the rigor to our process and so now i get my board of advisors involved with interviewing um we make especially senior candidates present a case study or like a, a business plan you know extensive referencing um i think that it's so important to get right um, yeah so for me, uh, having that process is worth it, even though you want to move at pace. I think mm. you don't want to rush that. You want to, you want to get it right. Um, mm. And yeah, and I think the other thing I'd say is that we, we hired a lot of people who were disillusioned with recruitment, a bit like I was. Um, and in some instances, it's just, it's the end of the road. Like if, if you really don't like recruitment uh, and you're done with it, I think there are times maybe when we should have realized that sooner. Yeah. Like, whatever we did wasn't going to change it. Whereas there have been other instances when you've actually really, you've been able to help them feel more valued. You've given them the things they weren't getting in the other organization and then, and, and actually turn it on its head. So this is what I say to a lot of people. And um, yes, we're not, we're not saving lives here. Um, we're not, it's not, we're not a rocket scientist, but you can change lives yeah. from doing what we do. And I think it's, if you can, if you can see it like that and really feel like, okay, I can help this person get on the property ladder. I can give them back time to their family. I can, I can really, have an impact in someone's life it, it can totally change your perspective on how you do the job and that's kind of what we try to focus on mm. now seeing the people that get that see that and really that can come out in the way that they do 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 business what, what was the best investment you made tools wise do you think if you're increasing overheads and mm. doing all that what would what, what's had a really good impact on your business um i think oh that's a really good question um I think Cube 19 has been, been a good, good investment for us. Um, that, must have, that must help now, right? Having visibility on. Yeah, but it's not, it's not in the way that maybe others would uh, maybe use it. I think obviously it gamified recruitment and, and we did for a while have it up on the screen. Like, yeah. You know, Sky Sports, but our culture and our business is really not KPI driven at all. Um, and actually, uh, one of the things we tried to create is a culture where people can s say how they're feeling. And, sure. and it got to a point where it was like, they didn't really actually necessarily want to see that every yeah. day. But what it is good is for driving the right behaviors in terms of people managing themselves. Um, and obviously we can all see what everyone's doing. Like it's there and you can look at your own one and you can use that to drive performance. But from a, an owner's perspective, having that data and insight is really helpful to kind of get a sense of what's what. So that, that for me is a really good tool. Mm, okay, nice. And um, just, to, just to frame this up then before we go into sort of, the last couple of years because i think obviously that moment where you sort of had those realizations were actually maybe um obviously when we spoke before this where you had to basically decide what you were talking about that became a bit difficult looking at the team maybe having to obviously um make that a bit more lean or whatever but like up until that point that you were talking about that led up to in terms of hiring and things like that like where where was you revenue wise as a business because obviously as you said your overheads were going up yeah so your, yeah what how think, were you there as a business I think in terms of and i'm, I'm pretty terrible with numbers but okay you know in terms of like t turnover we were like yeah one point well, i think in 2016 2017 we did about 1.1 million um uh, you know i think our perm revenues were probably it's kind of about 50 we did about four, i think in 2018 about 500 roughly about 500k per yeah um and then we had a decent temper um, but what we were finding was we were we were just our costs had gone up massively yeah yeah and 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 it was it was a, it was it was really when a couple of quarters i think back end of 2018 we had two clients that basically went under and owed us 40k yeah and we we were like it was getting close to christmas and we, we literally almost run out of money and i this is this business has been totally bootstrapped like there's never been any investment it's just yeah we've done it on our own and that was for me a really, you know, I have a daughter and a wife and a big mortgage and, and that was a really stressful time. And we yeah. hustled it. We sold a retainer. We, you know, we, we did what we had to do to get through. We didn't even go into the overdraft, but that was really stressful. And then, then about six months later, we found ourselves in a similar situation. We, we made like a 65 K loss in one quarter. Wow. And, um, and it was just like, we aren't, you know, we had a board meeting and we were very lucky to have a guy called Fred Jones on our board. Who's, actually runs uber in the uk and he's he's on the board of uber here and amazing how the hell do you manage that 
He's a candidate of mine. Yeah. Really? Center, yeah. And he's a friend. So when you so when you say just out of interest, so like because I think I had a lot of conversations where smaller businesses would love or want the opportunity to work with like a non-exec, right, for their business. So I guess having these people involved in your board and when you say have an amazing board, I'm assuming is it that type of relationship where ultimately you get in a room and then there's an honest relationship with everyone involved or is there a lot of commercial interest for these people in your business or what's the, and how valuable has that been? Yeah, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And it's something that any recruitment owner that I think that doesn't have one, I'd strongly suggest doing it. And I think, no, so there is no commercial interest. And I mean, it's all, it could be on the table, but basically the people that I've chosen are friends. Uh, okay. They're also brilliant at what they do and they all bring something slightly different. So we have my uh, one of the people that trained me at Michael Page. He, he used to run Hudson in the UK uh, after Page. It's called Stu Packham. He's one of our board. We've got an ex candidate of mine who's a COO at HSBC, oh, wow. former, former partner in a consultancy. So she brings the consulting, banking, big yeah. corporate experience. We've got um, Fred who brings the scale up experience and he's yeah. an ex consultant. He's a can- ex candidate. And then we've got Cressy, who's the wild card, but she's a sustainability entrepreneur, business owner, like easily one of the most insp- inspirational people I have ever met. And she brings a completely fresh perspective. Yeah. We, all it is once a quarter, I take them for, di- their payment is that we go out for a nice dinner, um, but we basically spend two hours just chewing the fat. And I, you know, they're very honest with me. I'm very honest with them about where our challenges are, where I could do with some, some insights. And they're always at the end of the phone. Um, and it's been incredible. And it was basically this point where we actually had a, a, a separate session with Fred, a strategy session, because we were in trouble. And we we did we went we were there for four hours, and he gave so much time. And, and it was me, Tim, and Jimmy, so the management team of the business at the time. And we did loads of analysis, and he he, he looked at it, and he just like, look guys, you look at the CV sent to all these clients and, and the, the revenue. You've got a certain chunk, and they're typically smaller boutique businesses who are paying you properly, who value your time. Who, yeah, when there's all these others who are just not, wow. and I, you know, it, and it became so. It just needed someone to say it. Like, yeah. we need to stop working with corporate business. We just they're like your style isn't fit suited to it. They don't appreciate the value you bring. Yeah, and um, and then the other side of it was looking at our cost base and looking at our our staff and actually realizing well, they're not you know, unfortunately we're going to have to make some cuts here because people are just not billing enough. And so, yeah, we basically, it was, it was a lot of soul searching. It was a very stressful few days, but as a management team, we, we decided to restructure Tim and Jimmy, you know, did, did an amazing thing. And both said, look, you know, we, we, yeah, as a management team, you know, expensive resources. Um, Tim, the plan had always been in time for him to move in house. Um, and he, he said, right, let's, let, I think it's now's the right time. Um, Jimmy, um, you know, we, we thought about, do we carry on as a two? And, and he ultimately thought, well, this is a good time for me to take some time out. Um, so oh, he wow. did. And then we sadly had to let, let two of the team go. And it was a really, it was really stressful because again, you know, it, Damien was a family and to the outside world, nothing has changed. We'd still delivered for our clients. We were still yeah. doing really well, but internally and financially it was, it was proving challenging. And, and I think I, personally didn't realize it but was incredibly stressed yeah i wasn't maximizing my own potential i was you know not seeing my family i was working harder than ever and there were lots of things that kind of came out of it and i I basically had to go to alison perry at the time look i know this isn't what you signed up for but this is kind of what i'm thinking and i think we this could actually be the making of us And, and i think you know I just sort of told them my new vision for the business and it was so nice that they turned around and were like we're totally on board let's do this and yeah and yeah and it it, the next day I you know cut ties with all our corporate clients very politely Um, and we got straight to work on rebranding uh the website we we kind of rebranded just to focus on high growth businesses and yeah launched the podcast within a few months we started doing events we started being punchier on fees and selling much more retained and exclusive work and critically you know we also claimed our lives back um Mm. you know we cut the costs in half over a course of six months um and we had our you know we were i guess the decision was vindicated quite quickly because we had our record quarter that next quarter between and so that was yeah that was that was really really, like a really good moment yeah so 
let's definitely segue into because I'm sure that that's obviously had a massive impact on on how you guys are surviving right now, right? With with what's going on, but just very quickly because I think there's so much value in there. And this has come up actually before um, with a chap called um, Tony Bates, and they did this exercise where they cut loads of clients and just and just worked out that again the same sort of process that you went through, but just to cut that down then. For people just to make that really clear so recruiters listening or business owners should maybe be doing this on a quarterly basis looking at the clients ultimately that um um what is it are responding correctly and there's an actual relationship there and a sort of um you're working with businesses that play to your strengths as a recruiter and these types of things so i guess that's just a really valuable exercise to do because as you said you can and as you're talking about you can really get lured into yeah we work for hsbc blah 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 all these and that's obviously a good thing to say and it sounds great but when you actually break it down okay we sent these amount of cvs to hsbc but sent this amount of cvs to x client and this is what's happened and either those so i guess yeah like i guess would you do you sort of actively look at that now then and look at the clients you're working with and are they is it a two-way relationship and yeah i think that's such a valuable exercise to do because you can get complacent can't you with yeah, of course. Um, like, yeah. Big brands and kind of the, the prestige of it all. I think one of the one of the things that changed it for me was when obviously I I've been working with this big bank and, and my third fee ever was that COO uh, yeah. or fourth fee. And at the time I just worked with the hiring manager. It was super slick, commercials were good, and uh, you know, I, I had a great relationship with HR, but th- there wasn't it was a very s- seamless process. You know, two years on, I was work- I remember having to dial into a call. Uh, with the, the RPO at this bank and 10 other agencies on the call. Oh, fucking weren't, hell. Weren't allowed a... I had to do that for one of my yeah, yeah. clients. It was horrible. And it, I remember and it, that. It's, it's like, this is not what we're about. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a race to the bottom and it just isn't going to work. And and, yeah. and I just I just don't think you can do this job in the right way if that is how you do it. And yeah. I think both so that was a real, that was a good. Uh, yeah, no, I think there's, yeah. So I think people listening, you should actively be doing that. I think that's such a great exercise. Um, so how, how was those difficult decisions and that process then helped you in where we are today, which is really challenging times. Um, yeah. obviously, um, times where it can change on a weekly basis, day basis. So how, so I guess I'm assuming that has, has all of that helped that I'm assuming that you've got some really good tight relationships with businesses that you work with that obviously helps in this time. But how, how have you been impacted, mate? What's, let's just set the scene. How, how yeah. does your business look today? What's yeah, been going on? It's, it's been challenging. I mean, we've come off the back of our, you know, uh, really good year. Yeah. That's really helped, you know. We've, yeah, of course. really helped. We've, we've repositioned ourselves, you know, from a personal standpoint, we've been doing some really exciting COO searches for big, for scale up businesses. And awesome. It's been really good fun. Um, and across the board, sort of everyone in the business has been doing really, really well. Um, so, in a way, this crisis that we find ourselves in, we're coming into it having had a really positive year. And Which really, helps. It does help. Um, and a I, lot. Think, I think the culture we've been fostering, uh, you know, is one of, of, of kind of being self-sufficient, being a really close-knit team, supporting each other and, and creating an environment where we all have a say, we're all able to share how we're feeling. And I think it's really important for leaders to show some vulnerability, you know, be honest when you're not having the best time. So you're giving permission to your team to, 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 sh- to sort of share how they're feeling too. And this is a scary time for a lot of us. Mm. And I think um, what, what we've been able to do is, and it, it has impacted our business. Absolutely. How, how, how many, um, so I think I've spoken to so many recruitment businesses and recruiters, obviously. So like how percentage wise in terms of live jobs, that have dropped what what's that look like yeah probably 60 60 70 percent uh yeah yeah huge proportion um mm. the good thing is we, we've had some we've had some roles that we were we were close to filling and that i think we'll still go through which is helpful and we'll hopefully buy this they're willing to pay so I, spoke, I spoke to someone the other day where they stopped. renegotiate terms on a yeah yeah because i had spoke to a chap the other day who had to who started retain search um and yeah, they turned around recently and was like, yeah, we're not, we're not paying for that. So we need to cut costs on that. It's a stick, this shit situation to be in. Yeah, it is. I think the good thing is we are all in it together and this is a great time. I, mean, I spent a lot of time talking to friends who run other businesses and yeah. it, there is a, a, we are all affected by this. And I think it's a great time to pull together. I think it's also a great time for the industry to show what we're really about and, and mm. to really add value. And be, ultimately, clients will remember you for how you react in this situation. Yeah. 
And so it's not the time to sell hard. It's, it's the time to be there, supportive, be understanding. Um, ultimately, deliver for, for the few mandates you have. Deliver. Yeah, make sure you focus and deliver. Get focused, exactly. I think what, what we've done is, you know, we were already... Alice, one of my team works four days a week. Um, we, we already have one day a week where we work from home. So we've been kind of set up for That's good. By working for a while. And, and it will be interesting to see how this long-term affects, you know, that. It's going to have a huge impact, isn't it? I think we may end up doing more, more remote working. Um, we have daily stand-ups uh, right at the beginning of the day, face-to-face -face interaction, keeping everyone updated. And yeah. what, what I've brought in, I, I'm very conscious, I'm a very positive person. But actually, sometimes I realized that, um, you know, that, that's not always the, the, it shouldn't always be completely positive because not everyone is going to feel that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is bring at the beginning of each of those sessions, give everyone a chance to say how they're feeling and actually. Nice. Talk to um, we're, we're doing weekly socials. We've done a couple of pub quizzes, um, you know, awesome. a safe work version of uh, never have I ever, you know, things like that to get mm. to know each other. And sending daily pictures around just of, of what you're up to and what you're doing just to kind of keep everyone motivated and, and, and positive. Um, but ultimately, it's about you know, if you've done the right things by your business, if you've empowered your team, if they're committed to your business and if you're honest with them, I think we'll, we'll get through this. And I've just been really, really honest with the guys about like these are the cost cutting things we're going to have to do. Yeah, it's for us. We're in a strong position financially, but, you know, we also still have to be careful of our cash flow sure and um, so you have to be honest and i've got them involved in that and they've, they've given their own opinions so you've over communicated which i think is really I, key I and stuff like really, this isn't i think it's really important uh, because it you know it takes away some of that fear factor the unknown and that this has all been hopefully how we run the business anyway mm. uh, you you want them to feel like they they are you know we have a profit share bonus so i want everyone to feel like they own a part of the business it's not it's not just employees that i tell them what to do it's very much a they buy into the mission. They really believe in it. And, and in situations like this, I think that is really should come to the fore. So I think yeah. it's a great opportunity for, for organizations. Um, but it's also, you know, it's understanding it's, you know, in terms of what we've done or how the priorities have shifted for, for us, it's been firstly making sure is everyone okay mentally, yeah, yeah. physically. One of the team, you know, had, had a loss not too long ago and we just said, just take the week off. You know, I think you have to be there for people in these different yeah. forms. Um, make sure they feel like they have a voice and um, I talked about delivering for clients. Absolutely. Supporting the clients that are no longer recruiting. Is there anything else you can do? Yeah. Um, and then I think it's a great, great opportunity to think creatively. I think mm. you know, we've, we've expedited the launching of a new proposition. Uh, we're not going to be selling it into clients anytime soon because it's not the right time, but it gives us time to work on that. Um, awesome. So innovation. I think that that's definitely what I've been. That's where my, where my mind has gone. Yeah, and marketing, you know, um, yeah. get, get hopefully some, there's budgets to, to get you in to help people with their personal branding. This is a great time to work on these things. And like, you know, I think whether it's your personal, your company brand, it's a chance to really show you add value, really show you different and also ultimately like show what you're about. And I think yeah. here's a great time. And I've been posting much more regularly than I usually would um, just to throw some positivity out there because I think we all need it. What, what, is, what has the coronavirus taught you so far? Do you think? Well, I, I, well, I think it's, life is precious. Um, yeah. I think I, um, what I've realized is, you know, this has given me a unique opportunity to be at home more and spend yeah. time with my, I've got a four and a half year old daughter, an incredibly supportive wife that's, that's kind of been through the ups and downs of this journey. All yeah. Day. Um, and I'm absolutely loving being here and, and, and spending more time with them. And I think that will take, it will change how I approach work going forward. Um, so that's been really important. And then the other one is just the importance of resilience and being positive. And mm. I think this is a time where leaders have to have to step up. Step and, up, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and be there for their team. How, how, how has it been being a parent during this? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm how are you managing that? Yeah, I mean, my, my wife runs her own business for, uh, and mainly from home. So okay. she, she, she's... Um, She's adapted really well, but she also used to be an English teacher. So oh wow, I'm very lucky. Like <laughs> my daughter is, is having lessons here and there, and you know I'm trying to help out where I can. We're going for daily walks and you know having lunch together and all that sort of stuff. So I, I must admit we're lucky. I know it's not the same for everyone, and I really feel for for others who 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 are in different situations. But um, yeah, for, for us it's been okay so far. Thanks. Sure. What um so just a quick one as we sort of come to the end of this like what on a day to day I'm just thinking because I think what what I plan on doing over the next couple of um, weeks is like 
maybe you've sort of noticed the same, but I think there's, there's loads of sort of content right now um, aimed and focused on sort of communicating to what people should be doing if they've been furloughed, um, which is obviously makes sense. A lot of people, a huge amount of people obviously being furloughed and it will be difficult. And I think the sort of excellent advice that I've heard and been given quite a few times with the podcast that I've done and stuff is very much remain match fit, personal development, um, these types of things. But I think that there hasn't been much out there on sort of if you have been kept on because you're someone that's part of the nucleus of the business and they back you to weather the storm and, and, and crack on and power through. Um, like what, what are you telling your guys that, that obviously are remaining and, and weathering the storm right now with you? What, what are you telling them to focus on the day to day, like real practical stuff? Cause I think I've heard stories of people being told to fuck off when they're trying to do business development and these types of things. But like what, what sort of um, activities and priorities are you, telling yourself or your guys to focus on that hopefully will give you the best possible chance of having the outcomes that you want. I, I think one is, 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 you know, this is a great time to hone your craft. Uh, yeah. Even back if to basics. Back to basics. Yeah. It's, um, it's a great time to check in with candidates. I think firstly, it's got to come from a, uh, you know, we, we ultimately, and I'm sure a lot of people listening really care about the people they work with. And yeah, this is a great time to check in with everyone you've placed, all the people you've worked with, see how they're doing first yeah can you help can you assist like and i think that first and foremost is the most important thing Um, i think the same for the clients checking in you know they're not necessarily going to be hiring but is there is there another way you can add value or just show some support so first and foremost you've got to put profits out the out the window and just go right just like be there because that you've got to play the long game with this it's not Mm. every the kind of reactive short-termist recruiter is going to is going to give themselves a bad reputation in this climate if they they're just desperate um and i think yeah i think you, ha- you have to be uh, the conversation i've been having with my clients is like you have you have to be empathetic you have to be a real human if you're doing sales calls and just actively phoning people because if you're not if you are being tone deaf to what's going on mm-hmm. um you're going to rub people up the wrong way and it's going to be remembered as you said and the conversation i've been having is that if you are generally having the intention of hi James, how's it going? I know obviously it's a difficult period, blah, blah, blah. Is there anything I can do to help? Blah, blah, blah. You'd be, you'd be surprised how sometimes that can go. Well, actually, you know what, James, um, we want to hire this person. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But I think, yeah, you're, you're totally right. I think right now, and this is what I'm having to do myself is like, look, all the people that are in my pipeline that have been pulled and these types of things, it's look, it's like, look, James, let's just put aside what we've been talking about how are you? What's been going on? What difficult decisions have you been able to make? How can I help? Can I help in the short to medium term? Like, and I think being empathetic and being a human, um, when you're calling people being proactive is a hundred percent the right approach, but you'd be surprised how much that would then return in potential sales or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It will. Like I, mm. I have no doubt it will. And, and it's not to say you can't send CVs and be creative. Yeah. Stuff, but it, if you've got the relationship with the clients that, that, you know, and you're doing it in the right way, like then, then it should be absolutely fine. But that's, that's ultimately what you can do, you know, stick to the basics and, you know, look after yourself and your own mental health. Yeah. Make sure you're, you know, I think recruitment owners have to be realistic in this climate. I'm not, I've said to the guy, I'm not expecting the same outputs. I, I just think mm. it's realistic. I think but, that's so important because yeah. there, there'll be a lot of people that maybe they're not being communicated. They might be, obviously I'm sure they're being communicated to, but, that may not be that clear. So if I'm recruiting, listen right now, and I think James, my boss, is like, fuck, I've only done, like, normally, like, in the normal month, I'd be here, but I'm actually here. What's James thinking? Da, da, da. Like, I think that's so important that hopefully a lot of people listening right now, their managers or leaders, don't expect the exact same outputs or even maybe the same outputs, but not the same outcomes. Do you know what I mean? That's so important. Yeah, exactly. And what you want is your, your team to bring the best version of themselves that, that they possibly can. And yeah. so that's not going to be working at hundred percent because their, their mind is on other things. There's a lot of heightened anxiety at the moment. And so, mm. um, but, but hopefully, you know, they're, they're getting the right levels of support, which will in turn, you know, show that they're, you know, that, that you know, that their boss believes in them and, and they can actually, you know, do what they can to add as much value to the business as possible. And I think that's in this climate, that's really, about yeah. what you can do and continue to develop you know develop everybody be there keep this is a great time for lmd and you know if you can you can even if it doesn't mean you have to go pay for it you know just take some time out to upskill yeah. your team and um, and also from a social perspective keep keep 
the positivity as high as you can and make sure that you're um you know it's not all work 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 because you know there is there's not as much work out there so you might as well spend time building yeah. a culture and, and getting to know each other better yeah awesome um well look before i ask you the the final question what what are you excited about mate what's what have you what sort of cool things have you got planned or trying to do mm -hmm. or well, yeah, you know, I mean, the next couple of weeks. For us, like, um, you know, we launched a podcast last year, and it's been a great learning experience for me. And um, we've had some some awesome interviews on that. So we're we're spending more time while there's less work around to to do a few more of those. Um, Amazing. Did our first webinar this week, and how'd that go? That. Yeah, really well, actually, really well. Um, it was a uh, uh, you know, I think learnings from it um but yeah. um, so far well received and i think we can do more of that sort of stuff and mm -hmm. so so excited i'm excited to get back to some sort of normality uh, yeah. excited for the clients that we have and you know getting back to supporting them um and and you know ultimately getting the team all back together in in person um but no this this year for me is is exciting because you know we're going to push forward with the things that we've launched in the last year we've got some new exciting propositions we're keen to kick off and and ultimately we want to keep getting better and keep driving that kind of high performance culture that we aspire to have awesome so final question james you can answer it with a phrase a sentence a word whatever comes to mind but if you could communicate to every single recruit out there they'd listen they'd take on your advice they'd implement it tomorrow what what would you say to the people oh it's a tough one it's so yeah. as you can probably tell i like talking um, <laughs> For me, I think the most I think the most important thing is to find your purpose and find what motivates you. Uh, like ultimately, for me, is is providing for my family. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Amazing. Uh, that's what makes me, hopefully, a good leader. And and you know, ultimately, I think if you can find what really inspires you, and it might not be recruitment, it might be something else, but you can find something in what you everything you do that can kind of get you going and get you out of bed in the morning. I think that's really important. And the other thing is, I think having a growth mindset is super important. I think, you know, learning from your mistakes, always trying to get better, taking on board feedback, which if I'm honest, historically, I wasn't always that good at and I've had to work on. Um, I think you'll find this industry, this, you have to be resilient. You know, I, I think you're going to have loads of knocks, but if you can get back up quicker from them and if you, you can learn from them, then you will be that much more successful. Um, you know, it used to take me days and weeks to get over the, 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 the things that happened and now I kind of yeah maybe I'll go for a little walk or put a put a hip-hop tune on and yeah, yeah. it is but do something and then I'm like okay on to the Let's next go. thing yeah um, so that, that probably those two things are the, the most important thing for me awesome James it's been a pleasure it's been a pleasure thank you thank you for having me really appreciate it